So what are the 16 custody factors that the court is supposed to consider when deciding a custody case? Hi, I'm Alicia Kinchla with Kinchla Law, a family law practice based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, if you've been following along with our daily videos, you've heard me speak uh, several times about the custody factors that a court is supposed to consider whenever they're evaluating custody. Now, I'm going to link to the list from the statute of the 16 custody factors, but we're going to talk about them a little bit today. And I'll probably do a much longer video because there's a lot of things to consider when going into these factors. Now, as always, you want to remember that these uh, videos are for educational purposes only. They are not legal advice. All right. So let's dig in. The first factor is a very important factor, which is which parent is going to um, encourage and permit frequent and continuing contact between the child and the other party. So basically, this comes down to are you allowing your child to see their other parent? Are you encouraging communication? Are you permitting communication and custodial time? So sometimes what we'll see in cases is that someone is limiting contact through telephone or FaceTime, um, especially if it's not unreasonable request amount of requests for time and contact. Additionally, we're seeing people who um, are just completely inflexible with um, the custodial changes in times, allowing the other parent to have extra time or maybe even allowing them to see the child um, for other family related events and things like that. So that's the first factor. And I think that's an important factor and it's a, it's a good reason why it's first. The second factor is the past and present abuse um, committed by a party or a person in the household. So this is kind of where, again, second factor, very important. Is there any abuse has happened? Has there been a Department of Human Services, which we call DHS, or Children and Youth Services investigation involving the parties in either household? And again, we talk about the entire household for majority of these factors. So has your household been under investigation, maybe not involving this particular child, but maybe some other child? And then the, the abuse also includes abuse of the other parent. Is there protection from abuse um, order against from one party to the other party. Those are things that must be considered. And so when you kind of dig into that factor, then another part of that 2.1 is, you know, what is the outcome basically of um, of that fact of the investigation or the involvement with any child, you know, child abuse claims. So that's the second factor. The third factor are the parental duties performed by the parties in care of the child. So, and again, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's parental duties. And when we think about parental duties, we think of those things that any parent generally would do. Um, if you have a younger child, the ability to make sure that you're feeding them on time, changing them, bathing them, so on and so forth. Older children, um, making sure they're, you know, clothed and fed properly, giving those things to them. Um, and, you know, haircuts, making doctor's appointments. All of those things are things to be considered under parental duties. Often you find that except for in the most egregious cases, uh, most parents have the ability to perform parental duties. But what you might see is that, um, and often I see this with fathers, that we look at what happened before the parties broke up to say who did certain things. And that might not be always the best way to look at it because we generally have a distribution of labor in households where maybe one party is the wage earner um, and does a lot of the work and then the other party stays at home and cares for the children. I know within my own household, my husband and I split our task. Um, he may do dinner, I may do homework with the kids. So it's important to not just look at what was happening prior to the split in the household, but also does the other parent have the ability to do those things? And most of the time the answer is yes. Um, and generally we see these factors weighed in favor of one part or the other. So some of these factors are generally either not applicable or they're neutral um, to one part or the other, um, to the parties, or they can be weighed in favor of the, one or the other. All right, so the next factor, we're down to uh, factor four, and this is the need for stability and continuity in the child's education, family, and community life. So how involved is the child in you know sports and activities in their own neighborhood, in a particular neighborhood? especially if in a situation where maybe the parent split up and then one parent moved to the other side of the city or maybe to a different county. Um, so those are those things that you're looking at. And then again, the need for stability. So we can't just say, okay, it's better for children to have stability. Okay. The courts and a lot of people think of children as being very flexible and adaptable to things. How true that is, you know, we'll have to consult a child psychologist, 
but really the idea is that you want to look at whether or not there's a need for it and sometimes we see that certain children have more of a need for those things um but generally you know we don't want a situation where maybe a parent is moving around a lot unable to keep a job unable to find stable housing those are things that are definitely going to be we again things that we know are going to be an issue but when it comes to general stability um thinking that a child has to stay in one place that's not necessarily the case all right um and same thing with education are they going to need to change schools you know how is that going to affect them what grade are they in how involved are they in school do they want to leave the school those are things to be considered too and we often see that factor coming into play when uh, maybe one parent is looking to relocate um, out of state or again far away from the the current location of the parties the next factor is factor five which is the availability of extended family so we do see that our courts do place a premium on um, the relationship you know we're, we're looking beyond just the parents we're looking at grandparents we're looking at cousins having a connection to the rest of their family is extremely important so the courts will often consider that so they'll look to see is there available extended family what is the connection like and just because someone has a host of cousins sisters whatever if they don't have a good relationship with them that factor can still maybe not go in their favor it can end up being neutral or it can go in the favor of the other party who may only have two siblings there but that child is extremely close to them so you want to pay attention to that as well uh, the next factor is the child sibling relationships so in this type of situation we're thinking about usually half brothers and sisters things of that nature um if one parent has two other children and then has this net you know this third child with the other party um you know they're looking often to keep those children together um and that's something that has to be considered a lot of things that i kind of see um especially with you know some parents is that that other party had a really good relationship with their stepchildren want to maintain that relationship with the stepchildren and want to make sure the child retains that relationship with the stepchildren so if they're able to show that they're going to do everything they can to advance that it doesn't mean that just because one party has other kids and you don't it doesn't mean that you're going to lose on this factor you want to be able to generally establish that you'll be able to help maintain those relationships um <clears throat> the next factor is going to be the well reasoned preference of the child based on the child's maturity and judgment so again there's no age generally where we'll say there's a cutoff where we'll say okay at this age the judge is going to ask the child what they want and whatever they say is what's going to happen the, this is just one of 16 factors remember that so if a child is saying hey i want to be with this parent we're going to look at that because what we often see sometimes is that one parent is more of a disciplinarian than the other parent and a lot of the times especially with teenagers and smaller kids the child is going to want to go with the fun parent so we have to weigh all of these things together and again it says the maturity level um, and the well-reasoned preference of the child so we're, we got to take all of those things into consideration and some children at 12 are, are less or more mature than another child at 14 or 15 so we have to consider all of those things but i do generally see that the older a child get the more the court is going to look and listen to what they want to do because the older they get is hard the harder it is to make them fall in order to force them to go somewhere where they don't want to be and then you start to see other types of behavior that can be very negative to them um so that's the you know that's the question i get a lot is when can a child choose and you know i usually see people asking that with children who are who are fairly young you know sometimes 10 and younger and they want to say oh my child is very mature the maturest 10 year old does not understand um the gravity of the situation the choice that they you know that might be putting being put on them so just be very careful about that um the next factor is going to be the attempts of a parent to turn the child against the other parent except in situations where there has been abuse so again if you are using disparaging remarks in front of the child about the other parent if you're doing things to harm that relationship all of those things can be things that are going to be weighed against you and sometimes we'll look to text messages other communications to see how you're talking to the other parent um and use that as a way to kind of almost establish that that's the way that you're also communicating about the you know with them about them with the child that may not always be the case but sometimes people don't turn it on and off and they're not even aware sometimes that the children are picking up these things and sometimes the judge will ask these questions in the child interview you know that what does mommy say about daddy what does daddy say about mommy 
and you know children tell it all they really do so you want to be very careful about the way that you communicate just generally about people in your child's life um, even if you disagree with them don't like them again except in situations of abuse or or things like that you want to be very careful about what you say all right so we've gone through preference we've talked about attempts to turn the child against the other parent and we typically talk about alienation parental alienation um, in that situation um, the ninth factor is which party is more likely to maintain a loving stable consistent and nurturing relationship with the child adequate for the child's emotional needs so if this sounds familiar to a factor we've already talked about that's because it really sounds familiar to a factor we've already talked about and often you'll kind of see that factor weighed similarly to the other one so generally it's you know there's been a bill that has been kind of up um for the last year or so um definitely pre-covid to kind of condense some of these because they were sometimes felt to be a little bit redundant or they can be collapsed a little bit into each other um, but this is one another factor that is similar and it just kind of expands on that a little bit you know what are their emotional needs what are their psychological needs um, and which party is more likely to really maintain it who's going to be more stable in their life is there a parent that comes and goes who misses time who doesn't exercise custodial time who works too much um, and chooses not to exercise their time these are the things that they're going to look at and again if you have a child with some type of special needs that's going to be um, further impacted there the tenth factor is which party is more likely to attend to the daily physical emotional developmental educational and special needs of the child again sounds similar probably could be collapsed into the other ones but this one is which more, which one is more likely to attend to their needs so sometimes i'll see in situations where again you have a party who works a lot maybe they're relying a lot more on third parties to do these things and that's not necessarily meaning that it's a bad thing and that's going to kind of be a factor we address coming up but if you do have a parent a party who is more likely to be able to do these things with the child and doesn't have to be outsourced especially to a party outside of the child's home that is important you know if you have a parent who's who's more responsible who's going to make sure they're making their doctor's appointments that they're on top of their immunizations that you know they're not falling behind in their schoolwork. all of these things are going to be important because those are the daily things that we need to do for our children to make sure that they are stable and secure um, and healthy emotionally and physically now the next uh, factor is the uh, proximity of the residents of the of residents of the party so how close do you guys live to each other again this is important depending um especially for schedules right so if you have a situation where one party lives on the other side of town um it can be hard to get the child back and forth to school and, and then one party wants shared physical custody that can be very difficult to do when you know you live far away if the parties live two blocks from each other you know it's not that hard for the child to go back and forth between the two parties and you'll see sometimes when people split up and there's a marital residence that's going to stay in play then you'll see the other parent try to move as close as possible to the other party so that it is easier so the child can stay in the same school they can keep all their same friends they can stay in the same extracurricular activities all of those things are important so the the distances between the two and the ability of the parties to get back and forth um, are they able to drive do they take public transportation you know all those things are important um, the next factor is each party's availability to care for the child or to make appropriate child care arrangements so this is kind of going back to a factor where i talked about attending to the child's needs so if you do have you do you're allowed to work we got most people have to work um, and most households were probably two two employee households both parents were working um, so it's not that you can't work but they want to look at you know do you have the ability to make appropriate child care arrangements um, and you know sometimes it has been frowned upon when one person works overnight you know they prefer to have their child stay with the biological parent especially if that other parent hasn't remarried and there's no relationship with the with their next um, significant other but you have the ability to work so just like you're able to do that you're allowed to put your child in before school care and after school care to be able to allow yourself to earn a living to continue to support that child um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing if you need child care but it is a factor um, and sometimes it can be used especially by people who are not you know able to argue that successfully against a party who does need to have child care arrangements especially when you have maybe a stay-at-home other parent or you know these days during covid um, a work from home other parent so those are things to consider as well and also you know with child care arrangements at, at this point you're looking at 
um, the ability of a parent to be able to um, do schoolwork with them at home. Who's going to handle the schoolwork if you have to go out of the, the house and work or if you have a job that demands that you be at your desk and on the phone even when you're at home. So those are things to um, think about. The next factor is the 12th factor, which um, or 13th factor, excuse me, which is the level of conflict between the parties. So is it high conflict? Is it low conflict? And this is an important factor and has been in the past for awarding shared custody. They've looked at the amount of conflict between the two parties. Are they really able to communicate with each other to be able to make decisions? And sometimes if it's really bad, and especially if it's in a situation where one parent just doesn't make decisions or doesn't make really good decisions, you might see a judge leaning towards um, taking away you know, the share of custody and, and looking at sole custody. But that's a high burden. But the, the level of conflict between the two parties is an important factor. And again, they're going to be looking at how do you communicate with each other by text, by email, in person. Um, have you done things to upset the other person? Have you done things to manipulate them? Is there protection from abuse order between the parties um, or just, you know, with one party to the other party? So these are all things, you know, it's just a high conflict situation. And again, that's what's going to happen. And really, they're going to also look at how does that affect the child? Are they witnessing? Some parents are horrible to each other. The kids have no clue. And, you know, I say, you know, that's a good thing. And I've been surprised in some situations. Children just have no clue because they've hidden it so well from the child that they don't care for each other any longer. And, you know, it's better than probably doing it in front of them. Um, the next factor is uh, the history of drug or alcohol abuse of a party or a member of the household. So, again, this is where the household is coming back into play again. If you have a history of drug or alcohol abuse, DUIs, um, which are, you know, can be an enumerated offense there. If you have someone in your household who has those issues, um, depending on sometimes you're judged, the marijuana use can be more of an issue, especially if it's done in front of the child. If you have a medical marijuana card, generally, you know, it's less of an issue. You have, you have the right to use it. But the question becomes, you know, what does the child see and how does it affect you? And, you know, how does that affect your ability to parent? But, um, you know, those things are extremely important and you'll see situations where certain counties do it more often, order regular drug testing and screening until a period of time has, you know, gone past with clean drug tests. And you'll see sometimes when courts are open where they're ordering the test forthwith, which means you have to leave the courtroom, go upstairs in Philadelphia County, for example, get a drug test, get the results and come back down and then explain yourself. <laughs> so and then not taking the test is considered to be a positive drug test. So those are some of the things you need to consider, too, is like what's going on, not just with you, but people in your household, who you choose to be around and who you choose to have your children around. Extremely important. The next one is the mental and physical condition of a member or party of the party's household. So does anyone in your household have any type of mental instability, any type of physical impairments that may impact the child? And we're not just saying that because someone has a mental health disorder that they're completely unfit now. Um, a lot of people get treatment with their with therapy or through counselors. A lot of people receive medication that doesn't make them a person who's incapable of parenting their child, but their ability to maintain their treatment, their their ability to manage their symptoms, um, and then physically, you know, do they have chronic illnesses which keeps them out of co you know out of commission for periods of time? Those are all things to consider. And again, the other factors of other people in the household as well. Are there other people who are unwell? Is there maybe another person who the parent is spending a lot of time caring for? All of those things um, are factors that are relevant to that particular factor, which was our 15 factor. Now, the last factor, the 16 factor is what I call the catch all factor. So this is any other relevant factor. So anything that did, does not fit into the last 15 that we talked about and sometimes you'll see this maybe as the work schedules um just just random other little things maybe um I'm trying to think of just a, an example but if you know generally work schedules is one that i see there um relocation is sometimes one that might come up there potential for relocating um some other type of third party situation that generally doesn't fit neatly into one of those other factors like the mental health disorders or the drug and alcohol abuse disorders. 
um, are, are factors too. And one of the things that they also will consider is the criminal history of the parties too. So does anyone in your household have a criminal history? Do you have one? And in a previous video, we talked about enumerated offenses. And these are specific offenses that are listed in the custody statutes that I won't say that the courts care more about, but generally they care more about. Um, and these are things that we would, you know, expect them to care a little bit more about, which are, you know, murder, manslaughter, you know, assault, certain types of assault, sexual assault, rape, um, child abuse, um, as well as some drug possession um, offenses are included in those enumerated offenses. So make sure you take a look at that. Again, like I said in that other video, does not mean you can't parent your child, does not mean that you can't have a significant amount of custody. There are other things that must be discussed whenever a party does have an enumerated offense. And generally you'll see a judge do what's called a risk assessment to see whether or not that party poses a harm to the child. And they might also send them out for an evaluation to make that determination or to help them make that determination. So I hope that you found this video helpful. I know that it was a lot to cover and we definitely, I mean, I probably could do a video for each one of these factors and dive a little deeper and talk about some specific cases that have been heard in our superior court, the Supreme Court, um, and even some of our local courts that talk about some of the nuances of some of these factors. And I think that's why it's important to have an attorney, especially when you're going to the point of making um, an ask for custody, changing, a, changing custody in a significant way, because these factors are extremely important. And sometimes they don't look the way that we think that they look or they they don't express what we think they should express. Again, there's some nuances. As we heard, a lot of these factors sound similar and they're but they're there for a reason. They're listed separately for a reason. So it's important for you to understand how, you know, one factor one factor can weigh in favor of you and the other can weigh, you know, not in favor of you. And an attorney who does a lot of custody work, who studies the law in this area can best help you to prove your case with the right types of evidence, the right types of witnesses, the right types of expert witnesses, and drawing out the right types of testimony, even on the other side through cross-examination to help you uh, get these factors weighed in your favor. And again, it's not simply a number. If you have, you know, six over, you know, you know, over the other party, does that mean that you're going to win custody? That's not how it works either. Some of these factors are way more importantly, just like I said about the children whose age and preference um, weighs differently depending on you know how old they are and their maturity level. That factor can have a little bit more weight when a child is 16 than when they're five. So it's important for you to understand just how that breaks down. Again, like I said, have an attorney who's licensed in your area, who understands the facts relevant to your case, who does a lot of custody work and who studies custody laws, help you to win or get the best decision in the best interest of your child in your custody case. All right, now, if you found this video helpful, I hope that you share it out. Hit subscribe, hit the notification button, so you'll be sure to get other videos like this um, whenever we drop them. We're doing one every day this year in 2021. Um, if there are things that you would like me to cover, if you have questions, put them in the comments. I, I definitely want to hear from you. These videos are, again, for informational purposes, but they're here to give you the tips um, that you want to know more about. That's what I'm here for today. All right, until next time, take care.